Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video, I'm going to react to why doesn't the USA have high speed rail? Now, this is something I've actually thought about like, you know, quite a few times. It's like, because the USA is obviously a huge country, you know, with a high GDP, the highest in the world. You guys could definitely afford to do it if you want to. Why haven't you done it yet? Just because it would make getting to, you know, interstate travel so much better. Like it would take so much pressure off your roads, your highways, it would reduce pollution, like carbon emissions. It would create jobs at the stations. It would, uh, construction work, it would, you know, boost the economy, it would boost infrastructure. There's so many pluses, you know, and it's just convenience. The convenience is it's hard to underestimate. Like in uh, here in London, for me to get to Birmingham, like, you know, at a normal time, unless I'm leaving sort of like, you know, 4 a.m. or, you know, midnight, it's gonna take me three hours, you know, in reasonable traffic. If I get the train, you know, for me to get to central London from where I'm at, it's gonna be 15 minutes. And then it's a two hour uh, train journey. So I'm saving almost a third, you know, at least a third really, because with see, with traffic, it could easily be a three and a half hour drive. You know, in, in Spain, like you can get a train from uh, Madrid to Valencia, like to drive that journey, it's like four hours. The train is two hours. So you're saving 50% of the journey time. I just don't get why you haven't done it yet. You know, you've got so much empty like land in America or land that's not densely populated. So you wouldn't have to displace many people like by constructing the, the railroads. Like why hasn't it been done? So yeah, this video, I'm hoping it's gonna answer this question for me. Let's do it. China has the fastest and largest high-speed rail network in the world. The country wow, has more than really? 19,000 miles of high-speed rail. Neglected this area though. The vast majority of which was built in the last decade. Japan's bullet trains can reach speeds of almost 200 miles per hour and date back to the 1960s. They've become a staple for domestic travel and have moved more than 9 billion people without a single passenger casualty. Wow. France began serving. That's incredible. Service of the high speed TGV train in 1981, and the rest of Europe quickly followed. And high-speed rail is quickly expanding all over the world, in places like India, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iran, and Morocco. And then there's the US. Yeah, what's going on, Mike? The US used to be one of the world's global leaders in rail, but after World War II, there was a massive shift. If you look at the United States prior to 1945, we had a very extensive rail system everywhere. It all was working great, except the number of companies in the auto and oil industries decided that for them to have a prosperous future, they really needed to basically help phase out all the rail and get us all into car. That is just so wrong. So you had a good network, you know, everything was going great, but just for pure capitalist reasons, you know, like these companies essentially made like train travel, like they did damage to it in some way. The inflexible rails permanently embedded in cobblestones were paved over to provide smooth, comfortable transportation via diesel motor coach. General Motors, Firestone Tire, Standard Oil, and a few other companies that got together and they were able to buy up all the nation's streetcar systems and then quickly start phasing out service. What? And literally dismantling all the systems over about a 10 year span. But why was that allowed? Why was it allowed? Such a thing would never be allowed today, surely. In the 1950s, President Dwight Eisenhower signed a bill to create the national interstate system. It allocated about $25 billion to build 41,000 miles of highways. The federal government paid for 90% of that, the states covered the final 10, and rail fell by the wayside. Can't you see that this highway means a whole new way of life for the children? And a way of life that we have a chance to help plan and, and to build. We dedicated a huge amount of dollars to building automobile infrastructure in the middle of the 20th century, and we're still kind of attached to that model of development. We went from a rail-served country to a auto-dependent nation by the 1960s. We've become a car culture, and it's hard to break out of that cycle, not to mention the fact that 
In our political system, we have very powerful oil lobbies, car manufacturing lobbies, aviation lobbies, all the uh, entities that the high-speed rail would have to compete with. This is the American dream of freedom on wheels. We average some 850 cars per thousand inhabitants in the US and China. Jeez, look at this traffic. Bumper to bumper traffic right here. Don't get me wrong, I love driving. Like, I do enjoy driving my car. But at the same time, I like the fact that I don't always have to drive, you know, especially if I'm going somewhere really far away, like knowing that there's a reliable train service that will get me there quickly. It's a great benefit, I think. And I think it would benefit a lot of you guys in the States as well. I know it's only 250. And we've never gone back. But according to some, this country's transportation ecosystem is reaching a tipping point. When you look at uh, what's happening with the corridor development, again, states across the U.S. who are recognizing they are running out of space to expand their highways or interstates. There are limits at airports. There is aviation congestion. So what are the options? A better rail system is one and could come with significant benefits. It's largely an environmental good to switch from air traffic and car traffic to electrified high-speed rail. That's, that's a much lower emission way of, of traveling. When the high-speed rail between Madrid and Barcelona and Spain came into operation, I mean, air travel just plummeted between those cities and everyone switched over to high-speed rail, which was very convenient. People were happier to do it. They weren't forced to switch. They did it because it was a nicer option to take high-speed rail. There's a sort of a rule of thumb for trips that are under three or four hours in trip length from city to city, those usually end up with about 80 or 90 percent of the, the travel market from aviation. Where rail exists and it's convenient and high speed, it's very popular. America, I think, is waking up to this idea that rail is a good investment for transportation infrastructure. It just seems like such a huge waste of money that you guys had an existing network of, of train tracks and a rail system that was working, which was then bought up and dismantled. And now you guys, you guys are going to have to kind of rebuild it again. You know, it just seems like a real waste. Obviously, I know that those train tracks that were built in the 40s would need to be modified and constantly updated and upkeep and stuff. But do you see, do you see, what, do you see what I mean? It just seems like a waste of money. But I'm glad that, you know, you guys are actually coming around to, to high speed rail. One survey showed 63% of Americans would use high-speed rail if it was available to them. Younger people want it even more. Right now, the main passenger rail option in the U.S. is Amtrak. It's operated as a for-profit company, but the federal government is its majority stakeholder. Train systems reaching top speeds of over 110 to 150 miles per hour are generally considered high speed. And only one of Amtrak's lines could be considered as such. That's its Acela line in the Northeast Corridor running between D.C., New York, and Boston. One of the challenges we face is that the Northeast Corridor has a lot of curvature, a lot of geometry. We really operate Acela Express on an alignment that in some places was designed back in the 1900s. And so it really was never designed for high-speed rail. And while the Acela line can reach up to 150 miles per hour, it only does so for 34 miles of its 457 mile span. Its average speed between New York and Boston is about 65 miles per hour, yeah, which is in stark speed, contrast to China's dedicated high-speed rail system, which regularly travels at over 200 miles per hour. But some people are trying to fix that. In 2008, California voted yes on high-speed rail. Now, a decade later, construction is underway in the Central Valley of the state. And right now, it is the only truly high-speed rail system under construction in the U.S. Ultimately, high-speed rail is a 520-mile project that links San Francisco to Los Angeles and Anaheim. That's phase one. And it's a project that's being built in building blocks. So the one behind me is the largest building block that we're starting with, this 119 mile segment. This, the investment, is, I, it's gotta be huge. We're probably talking, you know, maybe hundreds of billions, maybe, like to construct the whole network, but I, definitely worth it. Definitely worth it in terms of its impact in so many ways. This segment will run from Bakersfield to Merced. Eventually, the plan is to build a line from San Francisco to Anaheim, just south of LA. But as it stands, the state is almost $50 billion short of what it needs to actually do that. The current project 
as planned would cost too much and respectfully take too long. There's been too little oversight and not enough transparency. We do have the capacity to complete a high-speed rail link between Merced and Bakersfield. After Gavin Newsom made that speech, President Trump threatened to pull federal funding for the project. We'll continue to seek other funding. We hope the federal government will uh, resume funding the, uh, uh, contributing new funds to the project. I think in the future, as the federal government has uh, funded major construction of infrastructure over time, they'll again uh, direct money to high-speed rail because, in fact, it's not just California, but other states are also interested in high-speed rail systems. To complete the entire line as planned, the official estimate is now over $77 billion, and it's unclear where the money will come from. So why is it so expensive? Yeah, like, because there's just no way that the uh, Chinese high-speed rail network probably cost anywhere close to what the U.S. one. I, I, but I, I know that, you know, salaries are higher in the U.S., you know, things like that. Buying up land is probably more expensive too, but I reckon the Chinese uh, counterpart probably cost like a tenth or something like that, which is just a huge difference. I wonder, would you guys ever consider maybe, you know, having the Chinese build some of your high-speed rail networks, you know, maybe with some strict oversight on what they're doing? Part of the problem in California, the big price tag is getting through the Tehachapi, very expensive tunneling, or over the uh, Pacheco Pass to get into San Jose from the Central Valley. You know, Eastern China, the flatlands of Japan where they've built the Shinkansen, all of those are settings where they have, didn't incur the very high expense of boring and tunneling that we face, so the costs are different. And a lot of the money is spent before construction can even begin. Just in this little segment here alone, we're dealing with the private property owner, we're dealing with a rail company, we're dealing with the state agency, and so just the whole coordination, then we're dealing with a utility company, just in this very small section, we had to relocate two miles of freeway. And that was roughly $150 million per mile. So there's a lot of moving pieces to- $150 million per mile. <sighs> Some big numbers here. To, you know, anywhere we start constructing. China is, is the place that many folks compare. They have like 29,000 kilometers of high-speed rail, and 20 years ago they had none. So how have they been able to do it so amazing, quickly? And amazing. Part of it is speed. that the state owns the land. Mm. They don't have private property rights like we have in the U.S. You don't have the regulations we have in terms of labor good laws. Point. And, That's a good point. Environmental regulations that, that add to costs. It also delays the projects. It's a good point, to be fair. I imagine that the Chinese construction probably didn't have as much, you know, uh, safety regulation, oversight, you know, things like that, OSHA. Like, yeah, they probably were just focused on speed, like delivery and speed, no matter what. For some reason, and I've never really quite seen an adequate explanation as to why, costs to build transit or many big infrastructure projects are just dramatically higher than in other parts of the world, uh, including in other advanced countries. But the bottom line is we're really bad at, at just building things cheaply and quickly mm. in, uh, in the U.S. in general. I see. So there is just still some poor, just poor management, really. Like, I just don't know why these figures are so high. Do you reckon there's some bribery going on there? Maybe misappropriation of funds, money not going to where it's meant to go? So it's not just rail infrastructure that is expensive. All transportation infrastructure is. Just the physical investment in a freeway usually will be five to eight to 10 million per mile. But if you add seismic issues and mm -hmm. land acquisition and utilities and environmental mitigation and remediation of soils and, and factors like that, it, it can become as high as 100 or 200 million a mile. The numbers for high-speed rail can vary, you know, anywhere from 20 to 80 million per, per mile. The big reason why America is behind on high-speed rail is primarily money. We don't commit the dollars needed to build these systems. It's really as simple as that. And it's largely a political issue. They don't have political leaders who really want to dedicate the dollars needed. There's a lot of forces in America that really don't want to see rail 
become our major mode of transportation, especially because it will affect passenger numbers on airplanes, it'll affect the use of autos. So you have the politics, the message shaping, and then the straight advertising. And all three of those coordinate and work together to keep America kind of focused on cars and not focused on rail. Do you guys like, on your average sort of day, how much traffic, how much time do you spend in traffic? Like where you are, like, is it a, quite a really inconvenience? I guess if you live in a big city, it's probably worse than if you live, you know, somewhere rural, but is traffic quite a serious, like inconvenience for you guys, or is it kind of overblown? Some of the earliest support for rail came from the Nixon administration. Some of the original capital subsidies and operating subsidies for urban transit came from the Republican Party. So I think it's only more recently that maybe this has shifted that more liberal leaning folks who care about climate and a whole host of urban issues have really argued for investing very heavily in rail. If you had Democratic leadership on the Senate and a different president or potentially some leverage for a president to sign a new budget bill with some dollars from high, for high-speed rail, that could override those uh, objections from Republicans in Congress. But I think it's mostly ideological. They're big on highways. They're big on things like toll roads. They just, they don't want the government spending dollars on this kind of project. And they see it as you know, something those socialist European countries do, but not something that should be done in you know car loving America. In my judgment, it would take a very strong federal commitment, almost sort of a post second world war interstate highway kind of large scale national commitment. Wow. This is why some high speed rail projects are trying to avoid public funding altogether. One company, Texas Central, plans to build a bullet train from Houston to Dallas without using a dime of taxpayer money. Wow. We're taking what is a laborious, funds? unreliable four-hour drive, if you're lucky, and turning that into a reliable, safe 90 minutes. Wow. And when you look four hours down to 90 minutes. The, 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 the time save there massive you could just do so much more look at that as a business plan dr being driven by data this is the right place to build the first high-speed train in the united states the texas project is backed by investors motivated to make a profit and will use proven japanese rail technology texas central's goal is to complete the project by 2025. nice nice it's only a couple of years away Hopefully, I'm going to check, like, you know, if, they've make, if they're making progress. Anyone in Texas watching this, is it still on pace to finish by 2025 or have there been delays? A private company is even further along with its rail system in Florida. It's expanding its higher speed train from Miami to Orlando. Orlando is the most heavily visited city of the United States. Miami, the most heavily visited international city of the United States. It's too far to drive. It's too short to fly. We had the rail link and that was really the genesis of the, of the project. Wes Edens has invested heavily in Florida's rail project, which used to be called Brightline. Brightline recently rebranded to Virgin Trains as the company partnered with Richard Branson's Virgin Group. The team at Brightline, uh, which is now called Virgin Trains, has proven that, uh, that, that it can work, that people actually uh, want to get out of their cars and, and they'd love to be on trains. In order to reach profitability, the company sacrificed speed to save money. If you want to really go high speed, you have to grade separate. So you basically have to build a bridge for 250 miles that you then put a train on. That sounds hard and it sounds expensive and it's both of those things. So a huge difference in cost, a huge difference in time to build and not that much of a reduction in service. And now tech companies are getting involved with infrastructure projects. In to be honest, like as, as much as high speed would be great, just having a reliable widespread network you know, of, of, of uh, train services, you know, linking all of the states up would be amazing. You know, just for like someone like me who wants to go on this, you know, countrywide trip, it makes it so much more easy rather than having to drive the whole way or fly the whole way. In the Pacific Northwest, a high-speed rail plan is underway to connect Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver. Microsoft contributed $300,000 towards research for the project. A number one priority for Microsoft as well is to really see and pursue this high-speed rail effort happen. If you look at around the United States, where all the Fortune 500 companies are located, they all are in a similar situation to Microsoft. The housing is unaffordable, traffic congestion is epic, it's too hard to get anywhere and to get employees. So high-speed rail can solve this same exact problem in numerous regions around the United States. 
So is the private sector the answer to bringing high-speed rail to the U.S.? If the private sector wants to invest in transportation, and as long as it's not you know, impinging on the public taxpayers, I don't see a problem with the private sector moving forward. And I think there is some truth that the private sector is going to have much more of an incentive to hurry up on the construction and get things. I've always thought that Richard Branson looks a little bit like a, a lion. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Like, you've got the mane, you've got the... He looks a bit like a Mufasa. <laughs> Do you guys see what I'm saying? Like, there is a slight resemblance. Things done more quickly, more cheaply. That said, the private sector still has to operate with the oversight and the regulatory responsibilities of the public sector. So, for example, environmental review doesn't go away just because it's a private sector project. Uh, labor standards don't go away. The difference is that they don't have to keep trying to sell a project to the public for a vote to raise taxes or sell bonds. Some people remain optimistic that the U.S. can catch up to the rest of the world and have a robust high-speed rail system. We're Absolutely. building that right now it behind us. Uh, this 119-mile segment that we want to expand with the money we already have to 170 miles, it's going to serve a population of 3 million people in the Central Valley. So it's not only do I believe, but it's under construction. A lot of activity is now taking shape. State rail authorities have been shaped in four or five states. So they're actually taking these on now as a legitimate project and moving nice. forward. Nice. I think the future is very bright for train travel in the United States. There's broad consensus with our policy leaders in industry that it, it's time to move an infrastructure bill. And that will certainly help kickstart U.S. rail. Others are much less confident. I wish I were a little more optimistic. It's just very difficult to make the economics work here. No one has embraced it as a strong part of their political platform. There's just too many other tough, pressing problems we're facing. I yes. don't see us catching up to where the rest of the world is. It would take such a massive infusion of dollars for that to happen in California and probably waiving a number of environmental requirements and some other government regulations that hinder the quick deployment of these projects in favor of other values. My own instincts are that it's going to be decades and decades and decades before you'll be able to go a one-seat trip from San Diego to Sacramento or San Francisco. It'd really? be nice if there was just... So that's just within California. He's saying it could take like multiple decades. That's not very optimistic, is it? It's one simple answer. It, it's this litany of li factors that collectively add up that make this so hard to pull off in the United States. So. Very, very interesting video. So based on what, you know, the experts said, it seems that it's going to take a president who really, really prioritizes high-speed rail to push this through, to make this happen, just because of the vast, vast sums of money that are going to be needed to do it in the US, which I still am a bit confused about. Like, why is it so hugely expensive to do in the US? Like, I understand that building a network of, of rail systems in the US is different to doing it in China, but it shouldn't be, you know, that much more. Like, I don't know, you know, what, like, I wish you could maybe break, really break down the numbers. Like, where is the money going? Like, and how much of the money is being spent on construction versus all of the other things, you know? And is there a way to maybe spend the money more efficiently, whether it's, uh, you know, using companies from uh, outside of the country? I know that you would prefer to keep the money domestically, like to, you know, keep the money inside the country. But, you know, if you could save 50%, of the of the production cost you'd have to think about it wouldn't you like you know i i think countries do it all the time i, I you know i think the uk um is in negotiations for having a, a nuclear plant built by a chinese company i think you know like so so why can't the us use a chinese company for their high high speed rail yeah because i just think it would be you know it would be such a beneficial thing for 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 the american public just just to be able to not always have to drive everywhere. You know, like I, I can understand how frustrating it is to be sat in, in gridlock, you know, you, like especially if you're driving a manual car. This is probably why a lot of Americans drive automatics just because, you know, it's just, you're starting, you're stopping, you're starting, you're stopping constantly, constantly, constantly. 
But yeah, hopefully we see big progress in the next, you know, few years. You know, I'm eager to see if the one in Texas that they mentioned between, uh, I think it was Houston and Dallas, you know, is, is on pace to deliver in uh, 2025. Hopefully that, that will be done and that can then set the platform for, you know, further developments. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.